right, hello everyone. My name is Wu Jung. I'm a principal data scientist at Pivotal. And today we're going to be speaking about uh, how to run our data science workloads and massively scalable data platforms like Greenfront Database. Um, to kick things off, I wanted to begin this session by uh, kind of taking a, a bird's eye or a landscape view on the selection of open source machine learning models or uh, tools that are purpose built for, for large data sets. And so we have you know, Madlib, which is a uh, Apache project um, that includes many um, popular libraries for machine learning uh, to run on Greenplum database and Postgres. Uh, we also have H2O and Smart ML Lib uh, listed here. And then finally, uh, we have a section in there for procedural language extensions to R, Python, and Java on the lower left-hand corner there. And that's actually what we're going to focus on for today's session. Uh, we're going to go into a lot of detail on procedural language R and how it can be paralyzed on MPP platforms. Now, a, a guiding principle or a set of guiding principles um, when we're kind of speaking about um, data science tools for large data sets is that data scientists really want to, at the end of the day, be able to extract actionable insights from, um, from data. And um, we don't want to limit the size of data sets or scalabilities to be, um, uh, to be a concern uh, for, for data scientists who just want to get in there, clean up the data set, prepare the data set, um, run some machine learning models, and then um, um, get to discovery. Um, what we've often seen are data scientists, statisticians, um, kind of working off of uh, their laptop machines or servers that are running R, Python, and SAS. And you know, while that's uh, great from a usability perspective, I think uh, when we're thinking about data scalability for large data sets, um, there, are, there are huge bottlenecks. Uh, number one, there would be um, uh, a large amount of uh, data movement between the data store and the uh, computing environment. And then secondly, um, there are no guarantees that the computing environment, um, so your laptop computer, let's say, would be able to scale to the amounts of data that you are um, pushing and requiring for computation in that layer. Um, on the other hand, a lot of um, you know, data scientists, statisticians extract their data from databases, which run on pretty powerful hardware. And um, you know, some databases like Greenplum are purpose-built for, um, for scalability. right? And so uh, the notion here is to get your models closer to the source of, of where the data is stored and um, do this uh, more and more as data sizes grow. Right? So I'm going to be speaking about how to paralyze procedural language R in this talk, but in many ways um, you shouldn't be interested in what I'm going to talk about if all you're running are models on your laptop using smaller data sets. Right? Uh, we don't recommend PLR or Greenplum for those types of workflows. Um, what, this is, what this talk is intended for are scenarios where you've run into the ceilings, where you've run into the roadblocks on your laptop and you're looking for more scalable solutions to get the faster insight. Now, um, kind of on that note, there are a lot of tools out there. Some of the tools that I've uh, listed um, previously, you know, including Madlib, MLlib, H2O, um, that are out there for, uh, for doing just this, right? So data analysis on large data sets. And um, oftentimes, it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge to kind of understand when to use what tool, right? And so uh, this is kind of a, a mind map, if you will, of, I guess, how a, a data scientist here at Pivotal uh, would select which tool to use, right? And um, as we'll see later on in the session, we're going to be focusing on just one pathway of this tree. But to kind of give you guys an overview, um, you know, typically we like to prototype um, some data science model building in R, or maybe directly uh, model um, in Madlib or Pivotal R, right? And once we're at a point in the development cycle where we have a pretty good idea of which algorithm we want to use uh, for the final set of uh, deployed models, uh, we can then um, ask ourselves the question whether the algorithm of choice, let's say a decision tree, a random forest, if that's available in Madlib or Pivotal R as, um, as a module, right? If so, then um, our recommendation would be to go ahead and build those final set of models in Madlib or Pivotal R. But there are scenarios in which the answer to that question is no. 
Um, let's say you just read this really um, innovative academic paper uh, by a leading statistician and um, you know, she publishes the results not only in the paper but also through an art package. And it just so happens that you also, uh, you know, for the problem at hand, uh, it would make a lot of sense to kind of incorporate um, that newly found algorithm into your workflow. Um, that's sort of the, the perfect scenario for something like procedural language R or procedural language Python. Um, oftentimes, um, a lot of the cutting edge research in machine learning, AI, um, statistics, um, are usually accompanied by an R package or a Python package that practitioners can then use in their workflows, right? And so um, that's exactly the, uh, I guess, the, the workflow that we want to focus on for today's session, um, which is a scenario where the algorithm of choice isn't available in Madlib, Pivotal R, um, H2O, MLlib for that matter, and opportunities for what we call explicit parallelization exist, right? And in this specific kind of workflow, this is where uh, we'd highly recommend building your final set of models in procedural language R, um, or even procedural language Python. Um, again, in today's session, we're gonna be focusing more on the R side of things, um, but um, a lot of what we're gonna talk about for R can also be done on Python and Java. <clears throat> so before we get right to it, we kind of wanted to uh, describe a little bit um, and kind of define what we mean by explicit parallelism or data parallelism. Uh, this is a scenario where um, little or no effort is required to kind of break up the problem at hand into a number of smaller parallel tasks. Right? So those of you who are familiar with the R ecosystem, <clears throat> this is kind of akin to the apply family of functions in R. Um, you can also think of it as a parallelized for loop. Uh, MapReduce also kind of follows this pattern of coding. Um, I guess in plain English, you know, one way to think about this is if you have everyone in the room um, um, kind of uh, together and like the mission is to count up a deck of cards for some crazy reason. Uh, and so you have one big deck and you could, in one scenario, have one person in the room count up that entire deck by herself, uh, which would take uh, you know, a certain period of time. Um, in another scenario, you could divide up that deck into smaller chunks to everyone in the room and have each person in the room count you know, her stack, right? And then you can have that run in parallel and essentially um, kind of get to orders of magnitude um, improvement in the amount of time it takes to compute um, the car counting problem. And so that um, kind of applied to more, I guess, um, sophisticated machine learning routines would be the perfect scenario to, to make use of uh, PLR. Now to give you a background, so to take a step back, I mean, you guys are all probably familiar with what the R language is. It's a software package for statistical computing that has grown out of the original S language implementation, so it's the open source version of S. Um, but procedural language R is actually um, something that was developed for the Postgres community by Joe Conway. And um, it allows uh, uh, Postgres users and Greenplum users by, um, uh, it allows them to actually write R code and embed R code inside of SQL user-defined functions, right? Now, um, in the world of Postgres, this would be, um, I guess, uh, not be paralyzed, uh, but although, you know, you'd still have R code embedded inside of SQL, but then it would be on a, on a single node Postgres machine. Um, what's interesting for PLR in the context of using it on Greenplum is that you can then parallelize it uh, by the nature of Greenplum's MPP architecture, right? And so if we think of this uh, diagram here as a Greenplum cluster, and you have a master node and then several segment or uh, segment nodes here at the bottom, you can have an R runtime that are running in parallel um, across the stack um, and increase the time it takes, or excuse me, increase, um, I guess, the, the productivity of your data scientists as they get to, as they get to insights. Um, here, here's a very simple example, right? So let's say we have, um, data for US states, and we have distributed on Greenplum by state. And so in segment one, you'd have data for Tennessee, in segment two, you'd have data for California, in segment two, you'd have data, segment three, excuse me, you'd have data for New York, etc. cetera. Um, what you could do with uh, PLR is essentially build the model for Tennessee <clears throat> in the same node in which the Tennessee data lives, uh, build a model for California in the same node in which the California data lives and do this for all the states. And uh, if you go through this workflow, 
the time it takes to run a model for one state would be the same amount of time it would take to run a model for all 50 states, let's say if you have a 50 node cluster of green plum available. And so it's parsimonious in that it piggybacks off of Pivotal's parallel architecture. Um, you're minimizing data movement because data by state stays within the segment. And um, it increases productivity because you are now building the predictive model for each state in, in parallel. And we're going to go through a couple of code examples. And rather than kind of show that through slides, I wanted to jump to a uh, GitHub um, pages site that we put together. And if you go to this, this link over here, it's so a pivotal software that github.io slash GPR, and then you go to usage and best practices. Um, we actually have a pretty good guide on how to get started with, with PLR on Greenplum database, right? And um, you know, one of the first things that you should do when you're using PLR is to make a plan. And so um, as we stay here in, in the body of the text, um, you wanna ask yourself whether the problem that you're trying to solve uh, can be uh, phrased as an explicit parallelized uh, problem, right? Um, so for example, like could we parallelize by state? Could we parallelize by ID? If you have something that you could um, break up your data into, then, and, and you are okay with kind of building independent models by that group, um, then I think it's, it's again a scenario where it would make a lot of sense to make use of PLR in, in that workflow. Um, so the first thing that you need to do is actually uh, prepare your data for use on PLR. And um, we do this very often by using the array add function in SQL, right? And so um, you know, here's a very simple example if we use the abalone data set. Um, that's very popular. Um, you know, you can get um, understanding of, let's say, some example records uh, of this data set here. Let's say three records. Um, we'll notice that um, there are uh, not only quantitative data values in this data set, but then there's a categorical column called sex. And in this case, I think the three values that are available are M, F, and I. And so, you know, one way you kind of parallelize this workflow is to um, array aggregate each variable of interest, um, group by the parallelization index. In this case, one suitable index would be the sex column. And then you could distribute your data by the parallelization index. And so to do that, um, you create a table called, let's say, abalone array, and um, you would uh, kind of specify sex as one of the columns in your new table, and then array add all the other quantitative variables that you want to eventually include in your workflow by using this array add function. And then you notice here that we uh, supply a group by um, a sex clause here, which would um, essentially uh, provide the grouping that we would need to run the PLR function and parallelize our models by uh, the sex column. Can you say that the, the, um, the GitHub URL again? Yeah, uh, the URL is pivotalsoftware.github.io slash gp hyphen r. And I'm actually seeing one by Joe Conway for PLR. Oh yeah, yeah, there is uh, another one. Um, I think it's, if you Google Joe Conway PLR, um, he has documentation on the Postgres, the original Postgres implementation of PLR here as well. Yeah. So the Pivotal Labs one is a parallelized yes. fork of, of Joe Conway's PLR? The original PLR package, yep, yep, for, for Postgres, yep. Mm -hmm. And what is the maintenance we do between, because it looks like uh, Joe Conway still maintains his implementation. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know, and Ivan, if you have any insight on how well we keep up to date with it's the latest. It's pretty much just yeah. ported the same PLR, but to yeah. the MVP execution. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so, um, you know, if we jump back to the example here, you know, we start, you know, with reagging our data set uh, by, um, by the grouping variable of interest. And then um, that gets the data ready, but now if we're in the context of creating a function that will create some return values, we also have to think about and kind of preempt what we actually want to get back from the PLR function, right? And so in the case of, let's say, uh, a regression routine that we'd want to run on PLR, 
Uh, well, you'd get back the variable name, you'd get back coefficient estimates, you'd get back standard errors, you'd get back t-statistics, and you'd get back p-values, let's say, right? And so you kind of create this Postgres type or this um, skeleton table that sort of defines the structure of your return type. And in this example, we're going to call that structure LM Abalone type. And it's essentially going to be the target table or the target skeleton in which you're going to feed our results or output set from, from PLR. Yeah. So at this point, we have prepared the input data uh, for use in PLR. And we have laid the groundwork uh, to be able to store the output from PLR into tables in Greenplum. Right? The next section is now the actual definition of the PLR function itself. Right? Um, there are a couple of helpful rules to follow here. Um, each argument of the PLR function and its specified data type needs to correspond to a column that exists in the array aggregated table that was created in the data prep step. And so what I mean by that is um, each argument that you um, create in the, in the PLR definition function, so S weight rings diameter in this example, has to correlate with a array ag column of data in your transform data set. So S weight rings and diameter in this example code over here. The second um, helpful rule here is that the return data type of the PLR function should be a set of the composite type that was created in the return type step. And so uh, when you um, define your return values here in the uh, function definition, make sure you include return set of LM abalone type um, so that um, the function behaves um, as intended. And so if we look at our function definition, everything inside of the double dollar signs are R code. So um, this is pretty much the same R code that you'd write on your R console if you were to do something like this on your laptop. But then we wrap it around kind of this um, SQL create function uh, command, uh, which again, specifies the three arguments, the three inputs that need to be provided to this function. So in the context of linear regression, we have S weight here as the response variable, rings and diameter as the explanatory variables that we eventually want to incorporate into the function. And you'll notice here in the first line of the R code, that's exactly what we do. So LM is the R function for linear regression, and we're saying S weight is a response variable, um, rings is one of the explanatory variables, and diameter is the other explanatory variable. Yeah. Are you, are you trying to predict the weight of the fish based on the other variables? Yeah, yeah, like the, the weight of the abalone in this case based on uh, rings and the diameter of, of, of the specimen. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty contrived example, but the abalone data set is used for, for examples like this. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so, you know, what we want to get back from this process are the coefficient estimates and their summary statistics. And so we specify that using the summary uh, command in R, and uh, we return kind of a, a data frame or a table that contains this information. Um, you'll notice that here, the final line of the function definition is uh, language PLR, and so that tells Greenplum that, A, everything in the dollar, double dollar signs is R code and you need to now invoke PLR to be able to create and execute this function. So everything up to this point, we have, again, prepared the data, we have kind of set up, you know, laid the groundwork to um, uh, have Greenplum ready to receive the results from the PLR function, and then we have now also defined uh, the core process, the PLR function that is estimating linear regression um, on this Avalone data set. We haven't actually run the model yet, and so that's the next part of this guide here, so PLR execution. And so to do this, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's a one-liner select statement. You say select um, sex comma, and then you invoke the composite PLR function that was created up here, right? So LM Abalone PLR, that's the same name as this guy up here, right? And uh, the from clause has to be from Abalone underscore array. Again, that's the post transformed data set, uh, <coughs> array ag data set that we've created in this line of code or these lines of code up here. And once we do that, we get back a plain and simple SQL table, uh, SQL set of results that has sex, which is the grouping parameter, uh, the variable name, and then uh, corresponding uh, regression summary statistics uh, for each variable um, in the model that was estimated. So that's sort of like the 
um, I guess the hello world example for, for PLR. And I think through, you know, for in the, in the rest of this session, what we're going to do is we're actually going to kind of expand on this idea and do some interesting, um, I guess, kind of interesting synopses of how we've creatively used this framework for more complex uh, workflows on Greenplum database. Let's switch over back to PowerPoint here. And kind of, you know, one way to do this is to make this a little bit more interesting. You know, we talked about abalone in the GitHub pages uh, site, but now let's uh, pretend that we're kind of analyzing census data and you want to, per, you know, predict a person's wage, you know, um, uh, as a function of whether or not this person rents a house and whether or not she's married, right? And so you'll see a lot of the same constructs as we saw on the GitHub page. You, you know, kind of just start by writing the R code as you would on your R console on your laptop. And then you create, again, kind of that return type that we we're talking about, uh, which is going to store the model results. In this case, it's identical to the previous example. So we're going to store the variable name, coefficient estimate, the standard error estimate, um, the t-statistics estimate, and the p-values uh, from this workflow. And then uh, we're going to kind of pop that line or, or lines of R code inside of our definition for the PLR function, which again has wage, rent house, and married as the three arguments. Uh, three uh, variables that we'll eventually invoke in the R code here, and then we're going to return a uh, coefficient um, summary statistics um, um, at the end of this function. And uh, we're going to execute it now, and again, this LM function is the same function that we've just described or defined in the previous slide. Um, and here again, you get back a plain and simple table um, containing the variable names, the state and uh, corresponding uh, regression summary statistics for each tuple. All right, so you know, as I mentioned before, this is sort of um, what I've just described is kind of the the bare nuts and bolts of sort of how you'd use a PLR function. Um, I'm going to kind of go into ways in which we can apply this knowledge to real. Uh, problems uh, and use cases that we've encountered uh, with our clients um, in consulting engagements. And so the first one here is something that we did for a, uh, for a utilities company. And what they wanted to do is actually detect anomalies in their, um, uh, in their smart meter readings. Um, and so this utilities company had, uh, uh, had, a, had a smart grid of smart meters that were collecting data, I believe, at five minute intervals. And we had uh, a couple of years of worth of data for this smart meter data for one geography in which this uh, um, utility was um, operating in. And the objective here was to um, uh, build a framework for anomaly detection uh, to leverage in revenue protection initiatives. Um, and what we did was we made use of PLR functions specifically uh, fast Fourier transform and time series analysis functions in R that we invoke through PLR to identify 191 potentially, excuse me, 191,000 potentially anomalous meters um, um, in their geography. So this was about 7% of all the meters that they had data on. Um, this was done on uh, Pivotal Green Plum using uh, you know, PLR along with Madlib. And uh, from a performance perspective, uh, the FFT portion. Um, took only about 90 seconds to complete um, for over 3 million meters, right? Um, comprising about 3.5 billion um, meter readings. And then in the other portion of the analysis, which uh, made use of ARIMA models, um, it only took about 36 minutes to compute um, um, uh, ARIMA models for about 3.5 billion readings, so about 0.7 seconds, milliseconds, excuse me, per meter. Um, now, to kind of give you all a little bit more of a background on how we went about doing this, you know, we started with uh, looking at all data from all meters, so 4.5 million meters from about 20 billion uh, meter readings. And then we uh, needed to do some filtering and data cleansing, um, which uh, kind of had us land at about 3.1 million meters or 3.5 billion meter readings. The first thing we did was to uh, um, run a fast Fourier transform analysis on the data uh, to detect anomalies. And uh, that identified about 500,000 anomalous meters or potentially anomalous meters in the network. 
Um, and we kind of you know, uh, presented this model back to our stakeholders at this particular company. And they wanted to see a further reduction of the false alarms, the false positives, right? And so what we did was we kind of came up with a, a workflow where we, you know, in addition to the FFT analysis, we also ran an ARIMA model uh, that identified a separate set of about 500,000 anomalous meter readings. And if a meter was flagged as anomalous by both the FFT analysis and also the ARIMA analysis, it made it into sort of that final list of uh, meters that we asked the forensic team to go out and analyze, which substantially reduced the number of false alarm or the false positives that were produced by this workflow. Right? So a very interesting use case. Um, and in the context of this talk, um, you know, I wanted to also show some PLR code that we use to actually go about and, and, and do this, right? And so, uh, as we saw before in the examples um, in the previous section, we started by creating a type to store the frequency spec and max frequency um, estimates that are coming out of, let's say, an FFT routine. Uh, we know in advance that these are the three types of things that we need to capture back from uh, a fast Fourier transform routine. Right? And so we kind of set the stage for that and we create a SQL type um, as a skeleton target table. And then we create a PLR function to compute the periodogram and then return the frequency with the maximum spectral density uh, back to Greenplot. And we do that by using the spec.pggram function and R. And um, uh, again, everything that's in the double dollar signs is just your uh, plain and simple R code that you've run on your laptop. And what we were doing here is we were returning the, uh, the frequency value with the maximum spectral density. Um, and that's kind of uh, provided in these lines of code. Um, and then lastly, uh, we execute the function by invoking the um, uh, pggram concise function uh, pointing to um, a data set uh, named meter underscore data. Um, and if we execute this, then we're able to now uh, essentially get back parallelized executions of the FFT algorithm group by geographical ID and meter ID. So essentially, uh, for each meter that we're tracking in this data set, you'd be running an FFT in parallel inside of Greenpoint. Yeah. And we get some really interesting results back uh, by doing something like this. Um, I won't go into too many details, but we found that um, you know, most households use energy in daily or half, half daily cycles. And so if we go back to this uh, PLR function, this uh, frequency with maximum spectral density that we uh, spoke of here, that's the thing that's been returned by the function. We plotted all those values, <coughs> excuse me, on this graph here, and you can think of this one as a histogram. And so we're seeing that most households have a 24 hour cycle of energy usage, and, um, uh, uh, and, and cycles that, excuse me, households that don't see a 24 hour cycle um, see a half daily cycle usage of energy. Um, and so uh, that's great, because that, this kind of tells us what is normal, right? And so every meter that kind of falls outside of this normal range can then be flagged as potentially anomalous meters, right? which are about 20% of all the meters that were found in this analysis, right? And um, you know, this is uh, compelling because before running models like this that could potentially automate and um, increase the productivity of forensic analysts in, in identifying anomalous meters. I mean, let's compare this to what this person would have to do without these sorts of models, right? So um, in the before workflow, this person is looking through thousands and thousands of graphs like this. And then among the normal graphs, which look like kind of the ones up, up top here, this person, this poor person has to kind of find out and flag the meters that are displaying this type of you know, um, activity on, on the graphs. And this is fine if it's just two pictures that they need to look at, but it's like thousands of pictures every single day that they would need to plow through. Um, what uh, a workflow that, that we've done, um, that we've described here in PLR, what that would enable is essentially kind of reducing the number of graphs that look like this and increasing the number of graphs that look like this that this person, this forensic analyst, would have to sift through in his or her workday, right? And so it really kind of um, allows uh, smart decision support and kind of uh, directing uh, human resources to focus on uh, specific problems that need their attention the most. Right? Um, and so we were really happy with this analysis. And again, um, you know, it was 
a lot of it was done inside of sort of this PLR framework that we've uh, that we're covering in today's session. Um, the next one here is something that we did for uh, <clears throat> um, um, a major media company where they wanted to get a better handle on revenue forecasts for the advertisements that they're selling um, um, in their publications. And so what they wanted to do is essentially come up with a revenue forecast model uh, for every title that they were publishing um, in their portfolio. And um, again, you know, real nice uh, results and, and impact that we had on the business by increasing uh, the accuracy of the revenue forecasts and in turn um, giving their marketing team uh, better insight on how to optimize their um, advertising portfolios. Um, but here again, kind of for the purposes of this talk, I wanted to go straight into the PLR code that we wrote um, in this project, which did something very interesting. So up to this point, <clears throat> We sort of assume that each PLR function would have the same uh, exact model form. And then we kind of followed um, kind of a traditional coding uh, structure as we're kind of um, invoking functions and grouping by um, um, uh, parallelization parameters of interest. Uh, what we did here was allow for the variation of uh, the types of models that could be run in parallel inside of Greenplum, right? So if you remember back to like our regression by state example, every single um, um, state was running the same regression model. Right? It had the same model form. Um, it was predicting wages as a function of whether or not this person rents a house and whether or not this person is married. Right? And that same model has to be run on every single state. And you can't allow it to vary, at least in that framework. This extends that and allows it to be a little bit more flexible by essentially um, coming up with a metadata modeling table that we create beforehand. And this metadata modeling table, it actually contains strings of code that will then look up and invoke inside of PLR functions, right? And so what do I mean by that? Well, um, in this case, um, uh, we're you know, modeling, uh, me, we're building a separate model for each magazine type, right? So for magazine one, we want uh, a model form that looks like this which is different from the model form that we're um, um, expecting from Magazine 2, which is again different from the model form that we want to run uh, on the data for Magazine 3. We do that for all magazines in our portfolio, let's say 25 magazines, and we essentially have you know, potentially different models that we're running for every single magazine. Uh, you know, in this case, we're running Auto Arima for Magazine 25 and just plain old vanilla Arima for Magazine 3. But you could extend this concept and say, yeah, I want to run neural networks for magazine 25, decision trees for magazine 3, and uh, you know, random forest for magazine 1. And you essentially kind of pre-populate strings of code inside of a metadata modeling table. Right? So that's sort of the first step in this analysis. And then what you do, well, this next part is, is, is similar to what we've done before. Uh, we're going to create the return type to store results from this modeling workflow. So in the context of revenue forecast, we want to know the month, um, the actual value of revenue, the predicted value of revenue, and uh, lower uh, and upper bounds for our forecast. And those are the things that we're going to return from these sets of models, right? Now what we're going to do next is create a PLR function to run parallel models by the publication name, right? And uh, we do this by um, invoking the forecast library in R. Um, I'm going to come back to this point because it's important. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to read um, from that uh, model metadata table um, so that we don't have to create this very messy um, uh, set of R code in here where we're kind of saying, you know, if magazine title is equal to one, then invoke neural networks. If it's equal to two, then invoke, um, you know, random forests. We're keeping this clean and we're keeping it uh, as a reusable set of code. And any tweaks that we make to the model, we're just updating this kind of model metadata um, table and then running again that same exact PLR function, right? So what's happening here is that we are parsing, um, text parsing uh, what we've created here, which is just strings of code that we're storing inside of the table. We're parsing that inside of PLR, evaluating it, and then allowing each magazine title to have its own distinct and unique um, algorithm uh, to run and estimate uh, models on. Um, which, is, which is very powerful, again, in, in the context of being able to uh, be very flexible in how you're parallelizing your workflows. Right? Um, I said I wanted to get back to this because 
uh, for the R users over there, this is a huge deal, right? So what are we doing? We are invoking an add-on library inside of a PLR function. So there's over 5,000 libraries on CRAN that are available for download. And with PLR, you not only get core R functionality that comes with standalone R, but you can bring in any of the 5,000 libraries in CRAN and have them run in parallel in the same manner that we've described in this session, which is, which is very powerful in terms of being able to um, uh, leverage um, algorithms uh, from a wide range of, of different uh, um, academic disciplines and, and different um, um, industry uh, verticals. Um, so I'm, in this case, invoking the forecast library, but you could invoke XGBoost if you want to run gradient boosting machines. You can invoke um, you know, the JAGS library or the STAM library if you want to run some Bayesian regression routines. Um, really, anything that's available on CRAN, anything that's available on R, you can then parallelize inside of PLR. <clears throat> um, and kind of you know, using this workflow that I've just described, uh, you know, going back to this use case, uh, we were then able to kind of come up with um, uh, revenue forecasts for each uh, magazine title. Um, you know, not only to get the numerical summaries. You know, obviously we've had to mass the actual numbers here, but then um, you can get to graphs that you can also generate in R in parallel, which is actually going to be a good segue into our next session, and have it um, also display the actual values in red, the predicted values in blue, upper and lower bounds of the forecasts in, in light gray. Now, we've really kind of taken this concept of parallelizing all to the, parallelizing R extreme, R, excuse me, to the extreme here in the Pivotal Data Science team, because we said, hey, um, it's great that we're parallelizing models, but could we potentially parallelize visualization generation by using this workflow, right? Um, we've made, I guess the industry as a whole has made lots of great strides in uh, parallelizing and distributing machine learning uh, routines, but it still has a long way to go and making visualization scalable, right? So a lot of tools like you know Tableau, although they're great for smaller data sets, um, it doesn't scale to large data. You know, um, plotting functions in R and Python are the same way. Um, but again, kind of by using the um, data data parallel approach, by breaking up your data into chunks and having visualizations run in parallel, you can then um, uh, again increase the scalability of uh, plots and visualizations. Um, in your data science workflow in the same way, right? And so here's sort of what I mean by that, right? This is something that we did for a major uh, retail company. Um, we created a PLR function uh, that essentially um, made use of R's PDF function. And you can see where this is going already. We essentially created PDF files in parallel inside of PLR, right? which is again, very, very, very powerful, right? So for each grouping parameter of interest, we were saying, hey, uh, run these routines in R, and then save your uh, visualization, save your plot as a PDF file on a pre-specified um, file location on each set. Right? And so that's sort of what this PDF function is doing here inside of the, um, of the function definition. And uh, after we define the function this way, and a lot of what's in here in terms of the code is just kind of specifying how wide do you want your axes to be? What color do you want this line to be? What color do you want that other line to be? So that's you know, standard R code that we're invoking. Um, and then again, kind of the magic happens here when you run the function where you say, hey, um, run this uh, plot PVA PLR function uh, for each of uh, the grouping parameters that we we're interested in, um, and then store the results as PDF files on each segment. So here's sort of a visual aid that captures sort of what this workflow is doing, right? So Again, we have PLR installed on a Greenplum cluster, and in parallel, we're generating these PDF files on each segment um, in, in, a, in a way that allows you to be really flexible in how you're defining the different plots that are being um, produced, right? And so not only can you make use of the core plot function in R, but <coughs> ggplot is another one that you can invoke in the same way. It can now kind of parallelize not only model generation, but visualization generation by using this um, uh, PLR workflow. So up to this point, we've talked about parallelizing your modeling routines, parallelizing your visualization generation routines. And to really kind of go crazy, what we wanted to do is parallelize algorithmic development using PLR. 
And so let's say like you love what's in R right now, but you want to like create your own algorithm, uh, I guess computation routine for a new algorithm uh, by using core R functions as your helper functions. Right? So let's say there isn't a library in R right now that does this. Right? And so um, one thing that I mean by that is actually uh, being able to do parallel multiple MCMC chains, uh, Markov chain, Monte Carlo chains inside of PLR. Right, and so um, you know, in the in the very same way that we've described uh, how to run a um, uh, a linear regression model for each state in your data, uh, what we're doing in this workflow is now uh, running a simulation of a MCMC routine on every single node or segment of Greenplum database. Right, and each um, kind of worker uh, function is invoking the JAGS library inside of R to run those MCMC routines, right? And um, I'm gonna kind of quickly jump through all this because it requires some specialized knowledge on JAGS and uh, bugs in general, which is the code that I'm writing over here. And so what I'm doing is essentially defining the model that I wanna run in an MCMC workflow inside of this, let's say model.bug file. And what I'm doing is I'm now distributing this model.bug file um, on each segment, so that this information is now contained on each segment of Greenplum database. And in the context of um, Bayesian uh, regression modeling, one of the things that you'd want to do is um, increase the robustness of the simulations. Um, and I guess kind of uh, to cut to the chase, the more simulations that you do, the more accurate results you know, generally you'll end up with um, at the end of the routine. And so um, typically in this type of workflow, what you do is you'd run one or two MCMC chains on an R laptop on an R server, and then blend the two uh, chain results, and then uh, get to your uh, uh, finalized set of regression coefficients, and it's from those two chains that you've run inside of, of, of your laptop. Um, what the PLR framework on Greenplum allows you to do is run parallel MCMC chains across the entire cluster. Of, of Greenplum. So not only are you talking about running one or two chains of MCMC, but you can run hundreds of chains of MCMC in parallel. And all that we're doing here in this create function uh, statement is invoking that model.bug file um, inside of this PLR function. And so on each segment of Greenplum, it's going to be replicating this model.bug routine. And again, you end up with sort of um, each segment on Greenplum generating their own independent set of simulations, which you can then merge back together to get to more accurate uh, results for your Bayesian routine. <clears throat> now, uh, we've kind of begun to scratch the surface of how you can extend the functionality of existing algorithms in R by using uh, PLR on Greenplum. Um, the next section kind of is, I guess, the last mile, and now what we're doing is we're actually creating scalable versions of existing algorithms by using R helper functions um, um, in PLR routines uh, that would define sort of, let's say, uh, a routine for running scalable hierarchical Bayesian modeling uh, models, right? So as it stands right now, there isn't a, um, a module, let's say, available in Madlib, in MLlib, in H2O, that can run a scalable version of hierarchical Bayesian regression models, right? And so what we've done at Pivotal is actually developed um, our own uh, scalable prototype for running Bayesian regression by using PLR routines in the back end uh, that essentially compute a lot of the uh, linear algebra computations that are required for, for something like this, right? Um, and to kind of give you all an overview of, and again, this is kind of getting fairly technical, but to give you all an overview of what a hierarchical or Bayesian linear model is, you essentially have a likelihood function uh, that you can glean from your data. You have what are known as prior distributions for each of the parameters of interest. And so by parameters, we mean things like, uh, you know, we had that regression coefficient for wages and is married in that simple regression example that we talked through earlier, right? So each of these has a prior distribution. And um, what you do in a Bayesian analysis is essentially 
um, get to a posterior uh, distribution for your parameters of interest by um, estimating the posterior distribution of the parameters of interest by um, uh, by essentially kind of assuming that your likelihood for the excuse me your uh, distribution for the posterior distribution is proportional to the likelihood times the prior distributions of it, of interest. Now that's a lot of mumbo jumbo, I guess, uh, that I've just walked through, but it's relevant in how we talk about the parts of it that are relevant are uh, for how we then come up with a game plan to paralyze this algorithm on Greenplum database using PLR. And so what I've just described in this previous slide is a Gibbs sampling routine um, tailored for hierarchical Bayesian models. And there are bits and pieces of the Gibbs sampler that can be embarrassingly or data paralyzed. And we, and this is precisely uh, parts of the uh, Gibbs sampling routine that we uh, uh, make use of and abuse in, in certain ways um, inside of our PLR function uh, for scalable Bayesian hierarchical model estimation, right? So we figure out which components of the Gibbs sampling set of computations that can be embarrassingly paralyzed. And then for each of these um, building blocks, we build a PLR function uh, that corresponds to each of, and essentially it's a bunch of matrix multiplication routines that we can then uh, define in these building block functions. Those are the parts that can be run in parallel inside of Greenplum, uh, which will again increase the scalability of the overall algorithm and increase its performance for estimation. We then uh, build a meta function that kind of ties together each of the functions in two, so the building block functions, to run sort of this meta give sampling routine um, inside of Greenplum database. And this meta function is kind of like an orchestration there almost, where it tells which of these building block functions should be run at which point in time, and then gathers information as needed uh, from the building block functions to aggregate and update uh, the algorithm. And stages kind of, uh, one through three would kind of you know, define one iteration of, uh, of a Gibbs sampling routine inside of Greenplum. You can then run this function for k iterations and then uh, monitor convergence and then summarize results um, um, to produce at the end of your routine. Now, I mentioned building block functions and here are some examples of what we mean by that. And so um, one of the building block functions that you'll need in a Gibbs sampling routine for hierarchical Bayesian modeling is to sample from the Wishart distribution. And R conveniently has a function called Rwish, which draws random samples from the Wishart distribution. And so that can be paralyzed. And because, of, because it can be paralyzed, we've defined a PLR function, a building block function that serves that purpose. Right? Um, another um, you know, uh, building block function that we have um, computed here is the function that will draw new values of beta uh, based on what we've produced in the algorithm thus far. And so again, one of the building block components of a Gibbs sampling routine for hierarchical regression is to be able to uh, take a mean vector from the multivariate normal distribution. Luckily in R we have a can function for sampling from, taking random, random samples, excuse me, from the multivariate normal distribution and we make use of it here in this building block function, right? Now in this meta function that we've kind of talked about, sort of this orchestration layer, uh, we put it all together and uh, we package it up, we call it, uh, let's say, a Gibbs init, um, and, and we create that function inside of Greenplum, and then we specify a set of arguments that each of the different component functions or building block functions will need um, in their respective steps, right? And I won't go into all the details, but you know, we have, um, um, an initialization layer that kind of sets the stage and gets um, the system ready to run your Gibbs sampling routine. And you have a Gibbs update function that says, hey, um, using what we've just initialized, produce 10,000 iterations of this Gibbs sampling routine, produce 100,000 iterations of this Gibbs sampling routine, and update my results accordingly. Um, and that's sort of what's accomplished by um, what you'd see here on, on this page. So again, you know, we, we didn't really have a lot of time to go into uh, a lot of the underlying details and how this is achieved, but hopefully this was a way to um, get you all um, at least exposed to how you can creatively make use of PLR to build your own scalable versions of existing routines that are, that are out there, um, let's say as R packages, as Python packages. 
And um, you know, before we get to question and answers, I just wanted to close by um, pointing you to some online references and resources that we have for PLR. <clears throat> so this first link over here is that GitHub Pages link uh, that we looked at earlier on in the session. Uh, we focus on procedural language R um, uh, for today's meetup, but there are also um, examples in PL Python that you can take a look at um, on this GitHub page, uh, made by one of our colleagues, Ian Houston. Um, there are other ways to make use of uh, machine learning routines on Greenplum database uh, through Madlib and Pivotal R and PyMadlib, and we provide links here for those of you who are interested in that. So thanks again for joining today's meetup. Um, and I guess we'll now go into Q&A. So one quick one. Um, sure. Can you explain the difference between PLR and Pivotal R? Yeah, so PLR is what well, we just you know, talked about for today's session. So it's really about breaking up a problem into chunks and then running each chunk in parallel inside of the Inform database. Pivotal R is a wrapper, an R wrapper to Madlib, which is uh, a machine learning library to run scalable routines inside of Greenplum. And so you can think of Pivotal R as kind of, you know, if you're familiar with the Spark ecosystem, it's kind of like Pi uh, uh, Spark R uh, to MLlib or Pi Spark to MLlib, right? And so it provides, so maybe I should take a step back. So Madlib in its native form provides a SQL interface uh, for CAN functions, for SVMs, neural networks this regression, et cetera. Um, if you're a data scientist who is more familiar with R than SQL, then you would access Madlib through the pivotal R there, which would give you um, R functions for madlib.nlib, which would then invoke um, SQL routines for uh, linear regression on Madlib in the back end. So let's say in your example with the 50 states, if I wanted yeah. to do one model for without grouping it by state. Yeah, yep, yep. that would be a better use case for, for Madlib. Are there sure. any questions from the YouTube? Uh, nothing from YouTube that I have one for you. So in your data science work, yeah. especially when you make use of, of like green pump for large data sets, is R the only language you use or are there other ones you can use? Oh no, yeah, I mean R is one of the many languages you make use <coughs> of. I mean I guess the other popular one would be Python and of course SQL. Yeah, yeah. Those are the three most commonly used by the Pivotal Data Science team. Can you say a few more words about the, what is the dot .bugs file and what is the other thing, the JAX? Yeah, yeah, the for JAX sure. And the bugs? Um, I think we're over here. Yeah. And so uh, the model.bug file, uh, this is something that is um, an artifact of what, okay, so maybe to take a step back, we should describe what JAGS is, right? And so um, JAGS is, I want to go to the page for JAGS on Google here. Um, <clears throat> so JAGS is short for just another GIP sampler. And it is a, uh, um, a computational library that allows you to run um, Bayesian GIP sampling routines on platforms like R. And so in R, you'd have uh, a connector to the JAGS computation engine called RJAX, which would invoke JAGS sort of in the back end, right? Um, and uh, what, one of the things that you would be required to do or recommended to do in a JAGS routine is to produce a model.bug file um, that describes what you want to do in the GIP sampler. And so this is typically supplied as a text file um, that looks a lot like this. This is just one example. And so this specifies, you know, we talked about the prior distributions, the likelihood functions in, in one of the previous slides. And so that kind of defines uh, the specific instances of the prior distribution, um, let's say that we'd want to incorporate for this analysis. And so this text file is then kind of sent to all segments of Greenplum database. And then when you create a PLR function that calls the JAGS library, the RJAGS library, as we're doing here, um, RJAGS needs to find a model.bug file. And so this path is kind of how we're invoking uh, and allowing this PLR function to find that model.bug file. 
for use in analysis. Yeah. And yeah. What, what type of business problems are well suited to Bayesian hierarchical model as opposed to linear regression? Like when do um, you use Bayesian hierarchical model? I'd say whenever you can. Yeah, in many cases, it's it's the best, it's the better alternative compared to vanilla linear regression. Um, but it's especially relevant in situations where you know you have deficient data. So you could run a linear regression model on some data, but if you are not sure whether that data is of high quality, then you're better off uh, running a Bayesian hierarchical linear regression model. What what that is is essentially kind of conceptually. Um, Let's say you want to estimate the impact of price on sales for Coca-Cola, let's say, right? And you build, you have some data on prices that were charged for Coca-Cola, and you have corresponding sales metrics for Coca-Cola, Coca excuse me, let's say by state, right? And uh, the problem here, though, is that let's say you only have a few data points for California, and you only have a few data points, let's say, for New York, right? And you have a few data points, and this is happening in all the states. So for each of the 50 states, you only have, you have like a deficient data set and you get kind of results that are kind of all over the place in the context of estimating the impact of price on sales for, for Coke, right? Um, here, here's one way where you can kind of, you know, judge that or test that. Um, if, we're, if we're estimating the impact of price on sales, um, we would probably expect to see a negative impact of price on sales, right? So as you increase prices, sales will decrease, right? And so that is represented by a negative coefficient in the context of regression, right? But as any practicing data scientist knows, you often get coefficients that are just all over the place. You get positive price coefficients, which doesn't make a lot of sense. It's, it's basically saying if you increase prices, you will increase sales, right? Um, and, and so um, that often happens when you have deficient data sets. Uh, and um, one of the solutions to address that challenge is, let's say, a, a Bayesian hierarchical linear regression model. Because if, you know, in, in one scenario, let's say you have, of, of the 50 states you've run regressions for, um, let's say 80% of those states, well, let's just say 30 of those states have negative price coefficients. But 20 of them have positive price coefficients. And you're not going to go back to the client and say, hey, you can increase prices in these 20 states and let's continue to increase your revenue. That doesn't make any sense, right? Um, what that probably means is that the data for those 20 states are deficient, right? And what you do is essentially um, learn from the experience of other states. So that let's say if New York is one of the 20 states that has that finding price coefficient, um, you can average, in a sense, average the price coefficient for New York, which is positive, with the price coefficient for all of the US, a national model, which takes into account the data from all 50 states which we're assuming here is a negative value, right? So if your co coefficient for New York was slightly positive, if you average that, weight average it with, with the national coefficient for price, which is negative, it's gonna steer it over to kind of that, that negative value, the value that makes more sense, right? And so you're kind of getting it to, uh, again, yeah, kind of learning from the experience of others and partially pooling the results of the price coefficient from different states for New York. So this is, uh, you know, one of many use cases in which you'd want to use something like uh, hierarchical modeling. It's in many ways uh, similar to what Nate Silver uses in his um, regression, excuse me, um, um, uh, pooling result aggregation algorithm, where he's uh, weighing and kind of assigning weights to each poll that he gets um, um, election predictions for. And if it's like an internet poll, then you're going to assign that smaller weight. If it's a, a more trusted poll, you'll, you'll have it assign a more stronger weight, then you average the results from all those different polls to get to a more reasonable result. Is that why it's yeah. called hierarchical? hierarchical? Yeah. yeah, exactly. You're kind of invoking this hierarchy on the data where you have states, which kind of roll up to the US national model, and you can take it a step further and go worldwide, where you can then partially pull across countries of uh, price coefficients. I have a couple of online yeah. questions. If we're yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep, yep. So first one is a, um, a technical uh, technical one. Uh, the uh, Brandon online says, uh, as far as he understands, GPDB, so Green Plum Database Array, has a one gigabyte limit. Yep. Does this limit how you can use PLR and PL Python? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yes, the uh, if you array agate, then it will have a one gigabyte limit in terms of the data that you can store in that one record. 
but then uh, we didn't go into details of uh, the approach in this session, but there's a way to get around that by using um, uh, SQL, SQL aggregates instead of array X, which will expand the memory limitations to only be limited by uh, what's available at the segment level at, on green point. Yeah. And uh, Brian has an additional question here, uh, so if I can get it all in here. Um, our team has tried to use ready-made R packages in PLR, but we find that most packages accept matrix, data frame, or list. We need to convert multiple rows to array to hit the limit easy. The, um, okay. Maybe referring to the prior. Yeah, yeah, it may be the prior question. And so if you are running into. Um, yeah, so he actually qualified his question in the line below. Sorry about that. No, um, that's okay. Yeah. What is your suggestion for using ready made R packages with PLR? Um, use them whenever you can. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point of using PLR is the fact that you can import these libraries at will. So right. do we have a reference online for using array X? To, to summarize the data rather than array X? Using aggregates, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, there is a, um, yeah, there is a reference page. Let's see here. Um, I think it's something that Boston may have. Yeah. And you actually I have, have authored, right? No, I think it was for PL Python. Um, uh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. So, um, I think this is the right page. Yeah, here we go, yeah. So um, we can point you to this page over here. It's on the Engineering Pivotal blog. Uh, this is something that Ivan and uh, uh, Boston, one of our former colleagues, had, had put together. Um, it defines and uh, gives you some examples on how you use SQL aggregates instead of array ags for your PLX workflows. Um, they focus on PL Python in, in, in this example, but um, you can apply the same principles uh, for PLR and PL Java um, if you're interested. Yeah. Any more questions from uh, the audience? No more questions online at this time. Okay. Well, thank you very much. No, no worries. This is fun. <laughs>